Another crazy night Uber driving in the Sarasota area. On this evening, we left around midnight and we were out till about 3 a.m. And it got kind of crazy at the airport terminal. That vehicle right there was a female and she was arguing with the staff, the police, who's in charge of moving traffic through the airport. She said that if she decided to move her car, they would accuse her of running the cops over because she's black. Not only got to see part of that altercation, but my passenger who was there witnessed the whole thing, explained to me how it went down. Pretty freaking embarrassing. And this person really made a clown out of herself. The city of Sarasota in 2023 had zero homicides. That means that here in Sarasota, you don't have the same problems that you do in other parts of the country. And to come to our airport and accuse the police or something like that is absolutely pathetic and embarrassing. And then to throw the race card at the cops here, a place that isn't known for that, really is pathetic. This woman really made a clown out of herself. And just about everybody on the sidelines was looking at her, shaking her head, saying, what a freaking moron. You guys may have heard me talking about the police in Naples or Fort Myers or Melbourne, Florida, other parts of the state where law enforcement does have a reputation of that sort. The city of Sarasota simply doesn't have that reputation. I pick up a lot of young African-American males in the worst neighborhoods of Sarasota on the north end and I talk to them about their dealings with law enforcement and they're telling me that they have not had any problems with law enforcement. I've also asked elderly people in the community, people who've grown up in the African American community of Sarasota and they tell me that as far as they know they haven't had problems but a lot of those young men used to live in Naples, used to live in Fort Myers and they moved up to Sarasota and they confirm exactly what I've been telling you guys that in those parts of Florida, law enforcement literally is on a witch hunt against Hispanics and Latinos. And in those communities today, you see violence, you see shootings, but Sarasota doesn't have that crime problem. And one reason it doesn't have that crime problem and it doesn't have the homicides like Fort Myers does is because in Sarasota, law enforcement isn't going after the immigrant communities. In fact, there's a lot of investment going into the African-American community, both from the city and from business. And the African-American community of North Sarasota is no different than the Amish community or any of the other communities in the city. It's just another community in the city. And for this lady to sit there and pull this race card on this cop at the airport because she refused to move her car, she simply couldn't follow the rules at the airport. It's completely on her. And this officer was very patient and kind, and he really did a good job of handling her. And, you know, this is the problem where we're at today, where people watch too much CNN. They get these ideas in their heads, or they come from a place where there is more racism, and then they assume that where they are now is exactly like where they were before. But I can assure you that in Sarasota, that is not the case. The problem here is simple. She couldn't follow simple rules like not blocking the entrance of an airport, which is something that people in this area, particularly Bradenton, I don't even take I don't even take Uber rides out of Bradenton at this point because they cannot follow simple rules. But anyways, that was the start to the night at the airport watching this woman try to pull the race card on the cops there. It was really pathetic and embarrassing and a complete clown show that I've never seen anywhere in this area. But I think maybe she's not from this area because you have to be completely out of your mind. You know, at an airport is possibly the last place you want to start an episode like this because security there is usually very tight. Like, I'm even sometimes concerned that just having my GoPro on the truck could be a problem at the airport. Security at the airports is tight. So to see somebody acting a fool at the airport just goes to show the level of stupidity that some people are going through in our society. Catering to the lowest denominator, pulling the race card on the Sarasota Airport Police. I mean, yeah, oh, everybody knows about the racist Sarasota Airport Police. Come on, get the crap out of here. Some people just can't behave. And then every time they have an altercation like this, they try to pull out the race card, but nobody buys it. Everybody was just sitting there shaking their head like, well, this woman is making a complete fool of herself so we're taking our person to the island on this particular evening of uber driving a few interesting things happened one was that incident at the airport and the other is that i saw a freaking coyote on siesta key now the image is very fuzzy but somewhere up ahead or on the right side of the road somewhere on the right is a coyote running through the island we got to see it better once we turned around 
I got passengers in the back. They were drinking at a bar. I picked them up, and I'm like, yo, there's a coyote down, running down the road. I didn't have my GoPro running, so I got off, put my GoPro, drove back, and we wanted to see this coyote. But somewhere along the right, if somebody actually has the time to try to find it and timestamp it, but somewhere there on the right, there actually is a freaking coyote on Siesta Key. And it's my second time seeing it, but this time I tried to get it on video. I'm sure I'm not the only person who saw or captured this coyote, so you might see it resurface on the internet in the next few days. But yes, there literally was a coyote running down Ocean Boulevard along Siesta Key. And uh, we stopped here, we could see it on the road, and it really never ended up being on video, I think, or barely on video. But somewhere in here, running around, is a coyote if you want to take the time to try to find it on the camera. It's very dim, we could barely see it, but... Anyways, there was a freaking coyote running through Siesta Key. Just a wild night we were driving. Oh, YouTube. Uh, YouTube. You see what we have? I'm going to drive Uber. And I always put the camera. And then I saw what I did on the day. The bad clients, good clients, gave me money. And like a little extra money. Alright, so the evening started off at this gas station right here. So we're going back in town now before I even started the trip. This was where the night started. I got some Mexican food right here at the La Guadalupana, very good Mexican restaurant that's right there in Washington. And I think that's either 12 or 17, one of the two. And I got some gas, I got some Mexican food, I got freshened up ready for the night. And interesting that, you know, I'm starting to really feel at home in Sarasota. Like this dude, I'd seen him around town a few times before, so we talked a little bit. And then the car that was parked in front of me was this like Buick Grand National that's got big wheels. And I talked to that guy. I've seen him around town as well. But basically, Sarasota is really starting to feel like home. I know some of the police officers when I'm in gas stations, I see people I know and stuff like that. And now with the Uber driving, I'm meeting even more people. So really, I'm really, really feeling like Sarasota is now home. Like it really feels great to be here. I went out earlier in the day and I actually came back to the house. I couldn't get any rides earlier in the day. So I decided to go out late at night and I actually did really well. I think I made about 38% versus fare on tips. So that is hard to beat. With a rate like that, I can actually afford to keep running. As you guys know, the truck is very, very gas consuming, like 18 miles to the gallon. So I can't really go out there and not get tips. I have to get tips because the tips is what pays the fuel for everything. So I did really well on this evening. I picked up a guy right by that gas station and dropped him off in downtown. He was just going to go out for an evening of drinking. This was a Wednesday night, but believe it or not, there are a lot of people that go drinking during weekdays here, but they are out very late. And a lot of the Uber drivers are simply afraid to go out this late. It's just like very few Uber drivers are actually willing to go out this late to Uber drive because it's a little bit more dangerous. But I'm actually really falling in love with Sarasota. A lot of the tourists that I pick up are Midwestern. They're really good people. They like to talk and, you know, they tell you stories about back home. A lot of the places that they're from, I've been to like, I think like 38 states at this point or something like that. So like I've been to all these other states. So when people start talking to me about where they're from, you've been there. It just starts really good conversations. The Midwestern people really are like a massive percentage of the people I'm carrying are Ohio, Iowa, Wisconsin, Michigan, and they really tip good. A lot of Indiana as well. They tip good. They have good conversations. There's also a lot of people from Kentucky as well. And, you know, I lived in Kentucky, so the conversations are good. The tips are good. And I really am enjoying the night drives. Now, a lot of times at night, people don't want to talk, but on this particular Wednesday, it's just about every passenger I had talked. So it was really neat to spend, I don't know, four hours talking to people about the places they lived and experiences and traveling and stuff like that. It really is an enjoyable thing to do. And all of the things that were crazy on this evening happened outside of the windshield, not inside the truck. And that's great. I had a great group of passengers on this evening. Mostly people leaving the airports, going to bars, or taking them on and off the islands. And they were great. They tipped considerably well. I think 38 per every 100 fare is a great tipping rate. And that just about covers the fuel that I spent. So going out in the daytime was absolutely abysmal. It was horrible during the daytime. I couldn't even get rides. But after 10 o'clock at night, 11, 1, those times of night, the rides were plentiful. And the people that I met on this particular evening were quite fun. Here I am dropping off my passenger 
right in front of the Gator Club. This is one of the most active places in the city for people drinking and partying. About 95% of people when they drink are very fun and enjoyable. And a, t a lot of times they open up and have great conversations. So I will be honest, I like driving people when they've been drinking. It's It really is a fun experience. And a lot of times they're super generous above and beyond what you would expect. And on this evening, the generosity was good. The rides were plentiful, at least during the nighttime. During the day, like I said, it was pretty bad. But the general vibe is the following. A lot of tourists, a lot of like couples that go out to drink on a weeknight. And of course, those are people that live in gated communities, so they have a little bit more money. The average person is not going to be out drinking on a weeknight. But if you are kind of affluent, you can do that. I did get one snobby lady a few days ago in Lakewood Ranch. This lady reminded me of Naples so much, and I, I really am, I can't emphasize enough how much I'm starting to like Sarasota versus Naples and Fort Myers. I mean, this is a real city. Airports, beaches, just an incredible downtown with vibes. We got lowrider scenes. We got trucks. There's so much culture. There's so much food, restaurants. When there's people playing bongos and congas at passing cars in your downtown at 1 a.m. on a weeknight, you live in a fairly interesting town. And I really have enjoyed living here a lot more than I did in Fort Myers. And I do miss some aspects of Fort Myers. Like, you know, you could ride your ATVs and, the, you know, the roads were unpaved and stuff like that. And you could just do whatever you want. It was kind of a savage kind of life. But here, you know, you're probably not going to be able to ride an ATV in too many places out here. So it's a little bit more civilized and I kind of do miss the primitive aspect of Fort Myers in a lot of way, but overall the quality of life that we have up here is just incredible. And you know, the fact that you have all these islands and the airport is so close to the islands and all that means that you can make a lot of money Uber driving if there's people coming out of airports and touristy destinations willing to pay. But there really are two sides to Sarasota. You have the passengers, like I mentioned, the wealthy young couples and the people that are on vacation. Those people tip good. They're in a good vibe. They're happy. And then you have the others. These are the commuters. And the commuters usually don't tip. A lot of them know they're not going to tip, so they don't even want to say hello to you. I had one passenger earlier in the day who refused to even say hello to me. And I, I said, hey, bro, if you're not going to at least say hello to me, you're going to get out of the car. So I, I forced him to say hello to me because he hopped in and I was like, hey, sir, is your name whatever? Welcome to my vehicle. You know, we'll get you there safely. And uh, he didn't even want to say hello. So I was like, okay, you're at least going to say hello to me. I'm not saying you have to have a conversation with me, but bare minimum, you are at least going to say hello to me before you enter my vehicle because... I don't know who you are. I don't know what state you're in. I don't know if you're having trouble with your, you know, I don't know what mood you're in, what state you're in. And I have to somewhat clarify the level of sobriety, intentions, behavior of the passenger. So as an Uber driver, you're not just going to hop in my car and not say a word. No, you're going to at least say hello to me because I have to evaluate my safety before I take you on a ride. And I do that by starting a small, brief conversation like, you know, relevant to what we're doing. I'm not talking about, hey, how are you doing today? Tell me about your day. Not like that, but like, hey, uh, what's your name? Are you Larry? Okay, you're Larry. So we're, where are we going, Larry? Okay, let's get you there. And this passenger didn't want to even acknowledge me. I said, hey, bro, you're going to get out of the car if you don't conversate with me um, because it's for my safety. It's one of those deals where like I need to evaluate the person before they hop in my vehicle. And this guy simply, you know, you're not going to sit there and not say nothing. You have to at least say hello. I have to get some type of uh, confirmation from the passenger because I don't, I, I got to worry about my safety too. So these people that hop in and they don't even want to say hello, if they don't say hello to me, they're getting out. I'm dead serious. I don't give a crap about you. I don't give a crap about Uber. This is my vehicle. I'm the one that's paying for it. I'm the one that's driving and ultimately I'm the boss here. And if you're going to get in my car, you are at least bare minimum going to say hello. If I detect that the person wants their privacy, I leave them the crap alone. If somebody's tired from work, you know, you can kind of, not everybody's in the mood to have a conversation. 
I respect that. I'm not trying to force a conversation on the passenger. In fact, I avoid it unless I can avidly tell that the person wants to start the conversation. All the conversations that I had on this evening, which were elaborate conversations, were initiated by the passenger. I simply do not initiate conversations with the passengers. I let them be the one to set the tone for the ride. After all, they are the paying customer. But there's not a chance in the world that you're going to sit in my car and not say hello to me and think that you're just, I don't give a crap what type of day you're having or what your vibe or your mood is. No, dude, it's my car. And if you don't want to say hello to me, you're not going to ride, you know? And I told this dude, I said, hey, bro, you're not going to ride. If you don't at least say hello to me, you're not going you're gonna to get out right now, dude. And, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, man. What was your question? I said, what's your name? That's your name? Where are we going? There? Okay, let's go. And when he got out, then he was like, oh, have a great day and all that. Like, he changed his whole demeanor. But I don't really, I'm not going to put up with it. Because here's the thing. When somebody gets in the backseat of my car and they have the intention to hurt me, they're not going to have a conversation about how my truck is nice or, or, you know, where are you from? Or, you know, when I was growing up, I used to go to this lake or something. They're not, like, if somebody's going to hurt you, they're not going to have a conversation. So when somebody gets in the vehicle, and then there is the person that wants to play finesse. And that's why a lot of people are scared of conversation. Because with conversation, you can play in the finesse. So you can play in the, any other gimmick, right? But generally, when somebody has a genuine conversation, you can just tell when somebody's genuine and when somebody's not genuine. I can look at somebody and within a very a few moments depict whether this person is a genuine straight-up person or if this person is problematic. And if I had to generalize, I would say that rednecks and Midwestern people are probably the best. They're the most generous tippers. Uh, I can say that like couples that live along, like wealthy couples are usually pretty good as well. People that are well off economically um, and that are in a couple or scenario are usually pretty good, you know, like going on a dinner date or something. I, I got to say rednecks are exceptional. I mean, they always want to talk and they're always very just, I don't know, like they, they're very formal and all that, and they're good, you know? Um, but I guess the worst of the worst, if I had to generalize, I'm going to continue to say, unfortunately, and I hate to say this, but it's the truth, that young African-American females are absolutely uh, difficult to deal with. Older African-American females are sweet. They always want to talk about their grandkids and how proud they are of their kids, just like anybody else would. Um, but the young African-American girls, um, especially the ones that are like, ec you can tell they're economically challenged and stuff. Man, they are so problematic. They're usually getting um, something. They're, somebody's always behind the, the scene pulling strings, getting them to go somewhere to do something illegal. Or they're just never tipping, uh, never engaging in conversation. Um, it's just like there's a, they put up a wall. And I, I feel like a lot of times it's from a racial perspective. Like they put up this racial wall. That really makes it difficult. Just they're indifferent. And um, you don't have the same problem with black males. I feel like black males don't have that problem. Black males are usually pretty, uh, pretty good passengers as well. They're definitely not good tippers, but they are definitely good conversation having people. And they're enjoyable passengers because they do have good conversation. And they are very real, just like the rednecks. Um, and, you know, with Uber driving, you do make generalizations of people because you start to see patterns consistently either it's a neighborhood or a particular type of passenger like in my case i have had horrible luck with commuters day commuters i would almost rather have an uncooperative disrespectful passenger than a passenger who just sits there and pretends you're not there because i feel like that's even more disrespectful at least the person trying to run a gimmick on me is challenging my intelligence not ignoring it and i feel like it's even more disrespectful but anyways I have noticed a lot of Uber drivers become come of become prejudiced. And now prejudice isn't racism. A lot of people confuse those two things. Prejudice and racism are not the same thing. And people today are under the mindset that prejudice is racism. Prejudice is not racism. Prejudice is a natural protection for yourself. You see something that could be threatening and you protect yourself. On this evening, I had very young, attractive females... A lot of them are very young, they're attractive, and they're drinking, vulnerable. And I take them home without incident. I don't bother them, I don't hit on them, none of that. Okay, they feel safe to the point where, on this particular evening, I had one young female, and she gave me a very generous tip, we had a great conversation, no awkwardness at all. I commonly find myself picking up women 
who are clearly involved in debauchery and you're picking them up and you know whatever it's 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 the nature of picking up people late at night that are doing these things and they a young small female young whatever attractive doesn't feel uncomfortable by my presence so why would a poor black female who's not that attractive many times their hair is not taken care of they're not really polished up they're not looking good they're not really uh, something you're going to hit on. Why would you put up a wall? It's like the other day I had a woman, you know, didn't look very attractive, definitely older. You know, she was on her phone the whole time with her husband tracking our whereabouts. Like if she was the one who was going to get, you know, come on, like, pl- please look in the freaking mirror. Like, do you think you are the one I'm going to hit on or bother? Like, get the crap out of here. And I kid you not, like, probably... 30 or 40 percent of my passengers are young females late at night that have been drinking vulnerable whatever not interested don't bother them i got a wife at home but then you get these females that you know their hair's not groomed they don't look good sometimes they even stink they're not they're not attractive and they want to act like you are awkward because of your presence so now they put up this wall or they're tracking you on the you know it's like get the crap out of here you know like you have some people that they really have some freaking mental issue, maybe past traumatic experiences in their life. But, hey, I'm not the one who did that to you, so don't treat me like that. But anyways, you do have a bunch of people that are just freaking awkward. And unfortunately, it is almost always low-income people. Rarely do you have these scenarios and these shenanigans from people that are well-off. People that are well-off are usually a lot more disciplined, a lot more well-behaved. And I got to say, a lot of the young black females that I pick up, they are visually ticked. They're visually uncomfortable. They're awkward about having conversations. And it, it's perplexing because, after all, African-American males do have a higher percentage of pregnancy. Uh, they're more likely to end up with a fatherless relationship. So they are more promiscuous, and they end up in more screwed-up social relationship problems than anybody else. Yet at the same time, they want to act like they're hard to get or like you're interested in them when you're not or like they're this hot shot that, you know, like I don't really get it. It's kind of weird. But um, and again, when you get into more mature females, you don't have that problem. But there's always an awkwardness about some passengers. And I can say that so far, even like I already had my first bad review. Now, I've had I think 200 people have like given me like five stars. One person gave me a bad review. And it was a young African-American female, very badly groomed, definitely not attractive, uh, kind of overweight. And she, in her low hygiene, self-expectation personality, decided to say that I wasn't polite to her because her ride was not, I couldn't take it. I wasn't rude to her. I was like, hey, I just can't take this ride. It was a $50 ride to Avon Park, Florida on a Friday or Saturday night where I could have made $50 $50 in two hours. Why would I go on a five hour trek to freaking Avon Park where there's no way I'm going to even get a ride back? But dealing with this particular demographic, the last four passengers that I've had of this particular demographic have been problematic. I had one in Bradenton who I had to ask her to get out the vehicle because she was just visibly disturbed. She was making demands that were unreasonable. For example, I think I've done like 300 trips for Uber at this point in total. I haven't had a single person complain about the air conditioner. She said the air conditioner was too cold. And then she started making demands, asking me to drive faster. The house that I picked her up was clearly a drug trap house. And she was clearly on a run because I could smell the overwhelming smell. You know, I could tell she was just using me as a mule. And she didn't know this, but she was going to end this ride very quickly. But she ended it quicker than it had to be. She was even using somebody else's account. It was a guy's name and she wasn't a guy. Anyways... This is like the fourth consecutive young, overweight black female that I deal with who is problematic. Has every black female that I've dealt with that's overweight been problematic? No. There's a nice young lady that I picked up a few times in in downtown Sarasota, and she's freaking amazing. In fact, she's a freaking celebrity in her neighborhood. I kid you not. The last time I picked her up, there was people literally crying and weeping because she had to leave the neighborhood for a little bit. So... Yeah, there are likable personalities out there. You don't generalize. You don't become racist. But there are prejudices that sometimes are not based too far from reality. In the case of Uber driving, many Uber drivers do become prejudiced and completely avoid certain neighborhoods. Or if they pull up and you're not what they want, they pass on you. And I I don't 
really disagree with it. I feel like if I pull up to a passenger, and let's say this passenger, whatever they are, maybe a worker, the neighborhood, just a combination of factors. If I pull up and you're not exactly the last four of you that I've got have been problematic, then why am I the problem now for not wanting to pick you up? For example, I know in the case of young black females, they have the lowest incomes, all the worst analytics, so life hasn't been easy on them. It's not my fault. I don't pick these jobs. I don't hire these people. I don't make these laws. You can't be mad at me for a social problem. And I think what you do with a lot of people is that, like, whatever social issue there is, they want to blame it on you. Like, if it was your fault, like this lady at the, bla at the airport, the black lady fighting with the cop at the airport, it's like, it's maybe the cop isn't racist, but you might have just turned him into a racist. When you go around pointing fingers at other people all the time, Maybe it's you who needs to look in the mirror and say, okay, am I the one that's doing something wrong here? Because everybody isn't out to get you. But when you're like this lady at the airport who's you know, pulling the race card on a cop when clearly she's in the wrong. A cop at the airport is always right. If he tells you to move your car, you move your freaking car. Overall, I don't really think that Sarasota is a racist place. I ask people that live here of all backgrounds and they feel comfortable, including myself, and I've lived in cities where I don't feel comfortable. I don't think that problem exists here. Now, there's people that come from somewhere else with a preconceived notion that everybody's out to get them, and those are actually the people that go out there and make a fool out of themselves. And in retrospect, when you make up an accusation about racism with law enforcement and you use the race card inappropriately, what you're actually doing is that you are taking advantage of the people who were actually profiled by police and using their situation for your own personal gain. So this is actually a pretty embarrassing thing to do because you are taking advantage of people who have actually been profiled by the police and you're, you're actually taking advantage of your own people. So when you see somebody like this and they're pulling the race card out un, un, uncalled for, what you're actually doing is that you're taking advantage of the misery and suffering of people who have actually been profiled by the police and using that for your advantage. So you're actually taking advantage of racism. And in that aspect, many African Americans are actually contributing to racism or taking advantage of racism, making the situation worse for themselves. Basically, you're your own worst enemy. And vice versa, if you're on the other side of that situation, you don't have the right to deny that somebody else can feel that way. You can never do that because you don't know what somebody else is experiencing. But clearly here, I can assure you that these parking attendants and police officers are doing nothing more than exactly what they would do with every other idiot who would park their car blocking the terminal like she did. In that case... It's not really them being racist, it's you being an idiot. But today, people want to grab the race card and throw it at anybody they want to. But what they don't know is that when they do that, they actually see all those people watching in the sideline, they're all shaking their heads. You can see every last one of these people shaking their heads. The reason they're shaking their heads is because they are clearly seeing that this behavior is inappropriate and uncalled for. And if any of those people ever encounter a black person screaming that they're being treated badly, chances are they're going to relate it back to this scenario where it was uncalled for and overlook it. So this person, by behaving like this, is actually doing a lot of hurt to the black community. When you see black people behaving like this uncalled for, they're hurting their own community because clearly there's no racism at a freaking airport terminal. You're an idiot. You're blocking the road and you're not following the rules, which as an Uber passenger, I encounter this problem every freaking day. People who simply cannot follow the rules. And I, I, I want to add one last detail about, you know, Uber driving on this evening. Usually, I'm a big guy, so I intimidate people. So I'm always on the, I can sense that you're uncomfortable by me side. But in this evening, I had a few passengers that were very large, very muscular dudes. And they were drinking, and they weren't aggressive. But I told myself, if they wanted to be aggressive, I don't think I could knock this guy out with a hammer. So um, for the first time ever... I actually did feel a little bit of fear from a passenger. And it wasn't even because they were aggressive, because most of the passengers that I have that get this grunted or aggressive, I know I can club them upside the head and they're done. But this dude was literally like a giant, strong dude, like well-built. He wasn't aggressive, but it was late at night. And I just told myself, if, if this dude got out of hand, I don't think I could knock him out with a hammer because it was just a giant dude. 
And for the first time ever, as a driver, I actually felt a little bit of fear. And it wasn't even because the person was behaving inappropriately. They were a great passenger. It was simply the, the size of the guy it made me feel uncomfortable because I knew that physically I couldn't really overtake this guy. And the guy was a great passenger. He did absolutely nothing wrong but simply his size, it, it impressed fear into me because I know he was drinking. I didn't know how he was going to behave. He turned out to be a great passenger. But back to the notion of for the first time, I actually felt fear while Uber driving. And I've had passengers who are drunk playing with guns in the backseat already and trying to intimidate me. And those people didn't scare me. I had one young kid who clearly had some mental trauma. He was just one of those people that the only thing they wanted to talk about were guns and weapons. And it really felt like the person's personality, not so much their size, but just their personality was very fixed on just very into weapons and violence and stuff. And it made me feel awkward and a little concerned, but this dude simply by his size intimidated me. So now I can kind of feel how a female passenger can feel when I'm in the car simply because of my size. So it's one of those things where I've never experienced it, but for the first time I experienced this, where, okay, here's this person who I'm trapped in a car with who is clearly much larger and stronger than me. So there's all that. There's always an awkwardness to being in a vehicle with a complete stranger, but for the most part, most passengers are great and most drivers are great. The fact remains, there's always a human nature of fear. And ultimately, it wasn't even the intention of somebody trying to scare me with a gun that made me scared. It was just the fact that this passenger was so large that I figured that if he wanted to fight with me or whatever, that I probably couldn't do much about it. So, you know, anyways, that is a night of Uber driving. There's always awkward experiences as, as expected with Uber driving. But overall, it was a very nice evening. Tips were generous. Passengers were great. I really had a great time. And the more that I do this, the more I fall in love with the city of Sarasota and the more disdain I get for the area of Bradenton, because it really is like Sarasota's where I get all my great tips and great customers, and Bradenton is usually where I get my problematic customers. So Bradenton has really been a disappointment since I started Uber driving because the propensity for people not to follow rules, not to behave is always there. It's unreal how uncivilized some of these people are. But I think the lesson in today's video is that there are great people out there and that not everybody's out to get you. And if you're one of those people that feels like the world's out to get you, maybe you just now have become the prejudice yourself. Because when you're so afraid of prejudice that now you start to treat other people differently because you think they're treating you differently, that is the point where now you become just as bad as the perpetrator. You become the perpetrator now. And that's kind of why I left Alabama. Because in Alabama, I was being treated so badly by people that I started to treat people back badly even when they weren't being bad to me simply because I felt the preconceived notion that, well, if you're going to disrespect me, I'm going to disrespect you and it leads you to become an angry, bitter person. But I feel like in Sarasota, I have really, especially with dealing with these Midwestern people, sometimes you can detect a little bit of ignorance, but you have to overlook it, okay? There's a difference between ignorance, prejudice, and racism. They're not the same thing. And look, I have a Hispanic name on my Uber. They know I'm a Jose, but I'm white. They're going to be curious. Every passenger is going to ask me where I'm from. And it's not like they're being rude. It's not like they're being ignorant. It's just a normal human curiosity. Just about every single passenger that I get asks me where I'm from. It's a normal conversation, people, okay? And I'm sure if I was like Indian or some other less common nationality, then the question would probably be even more common, even more relevant. Like I have passengers who I ask them, like, where are you from? Because they clearly look different. Does that mean that these passengers, I'm being rude to them? No, I'm just trying to learn about you and be respectful and decent and learn about your culture. Doesn't that mean that I'm being prejudiced? No, absolutely not. I mean, people today have put up all these walls. But what I love about Uber driving it's just that you're dealing with real people. And a lot of these social media prejudices that we hear on the media and TV and all that, when you sit down in a car with a complete stranger and you have a complete normal conversation, a lot of that garbage just goes out the window. You're dealing with real people, and that's the way it's supposed to be. Koreans are some of the shyest people I've met by nature. It's their culture to be that way. I had some Korean passengers, and I forced questions onto them. I, I was very forceful. And I told them about me unwarrantedly, and I asked them questions about their food and their culture and their, their, their everything. 
it because they're timid people, but I force a conversation on. It's like probably the only time I've ever forced a conversation onto somebody was with these Korean passengers because I'm frustrated. I've tried every polite and decent, respectful way of dealing with Koreans, and like I'm not going to not talk to you because you're Korean. That's not gonna happen. That's not how I go. So, but social interactions with real people, you know, are different than the rhetoric you hear on social media every day. I think a lot of these people that behave like these people at the airport is because they spend so much time on social media and they're so reclusive in their own circle that they haven't stepped outside of their show and talked and met real people in a long time. And one thing that I have noticed while Uber driving, the vast majority of my customers are going to be white Midwestern people. And, you know, they are great. And when I came out of Alabama, I had to work out some issues within myself because of the way I was treated in Alabama. And these people here, they haven't just healed and repaired the damage that I got from Alabama. They've actually kind of made me fall in love again with the American culture and the American people. You know, like all these Midwestern people are freaking great people. I mean, they're just, uh, they're, they're, they, they, is that CJ from San Andreas about to spring up right there by that spring? Do you guys catch that character spawning right there on the left by that water fountain? I wonder if it's like, is that a CJ from San Andreas or is that going to be like one of those? Maybe it's a mission you can go on. Next time I'm in downtown Sarasota, so I'm hopping in that fountain and see what mission I can go on. But anyways, most of these Midwestern people, they admit a lot of times that their towns are backwards and that the people are ignorant. And they just are awesome. The conversations are great. There's so much in common. Even like when I deal with people from Kentucky, more backwards of a place. You can clearly tell, you know, they understand a lot of the stuff. They open, they, they talk about those issues and stuff like that. They deal with their in small towns, you know. There is a level of ignorance in some of the people. A lot of the locals, actually, more than the outsiders, you know, regarding, you know, immigration and stuff like that. We're like, well, all these immigrants are coming over here. And I said, well, I'm an immigrant. Do you want to walk home or do you want to finish this ride? Because if you don't want to benefit from immigrants... Oh, I'm an immigrant. Okay, well, do you want to walk home? Because I'm an immigrant. Oh, okay, you don't want to walk. Let me know. Let me know because, you, you know, I'm an immigrant. So if, if you want to walk home, you can walk home right now. But, you know, there is a level of ignorance still out there that's visible. But I feel like it's mostly coming from people who spend too much time either on TV or social media. You know, if they get on CNN, they think the cops are going to kill them because they're racist. And if they're on Fox News, then they think the immigrants are coming here to take my gear. They took my gear, man. You know, like, but it's it's people that spend too much time in front of their TVs, you know. Most people who are out and about enjoying their life and enjoying the beach are going to talk about their vacations, their travels, their goals, their aspirations. Hey, man, how do you buy this truck? Or, you know, I, you know more in-depth conversations. When you go to race in politics, boy, you are mentally primitive because those are just very basic thoughts that social media has influenced your brain and you don't really think outside the box. But most of the people that I talk to that are wealthy, they're not preoccupied with Fox News or CNN. They're preoccupied with travel. They're preoccupied with business, you're, you're, you know, a more in-depth conversation. And I think that's one of the key factors that distinguishes people that are wealthy from people that are poor. A lot of times people that are wealthy are, are you know, they're actually, when I say wealthy, I'm not just talking monetarily. I'm talking their health, their mental state. You know, people that are prosperous doesn't exactly equate to money. You could be poor and be prosperous in personality and positivity. I mean, a lot of poor people that are wealthy, they might work a normal nine to five job, but their brain isn't at that level they their brain their mindset their vibe is it's fixated on positivity like i get a lot of jamaicans here a lot of the jamaicans that i meet they're not wealthy they're working normal jobs but these dudes are just nothing but positivity nothing but like appreciation for life for example you know it's like that old movie quote home the way you make it you know how the way you make it now nah. you know you like home the way you make it you like home the way you make it that's cool with me, man. If, if, if you like home the way you make it, you like home the way you make it. You know what I'm saying? Home the way you make it. You can either be negative or you can be positive. You can have positive, uplifting conversations or you can be dragged into the negativity of social media. And that is what a lot of people do. 
I get people, and as soon as they get in the car, you know, you're seeing those migrants in New York City down there. And I'm like, look, dude, talk to me about the food in New York City. Talk to me about the cityscape. Talk to me about all the great things that are happening in New York City. I don't give a crap about migrants staying in a hotel. But that's the thing. Some people are just so sucked into CNN and Fox News that it's all they can talk about. And those people really do suck. They ruin the vibe. But overwhelmingly along the beaches of Sarasota, mostly awesome people, awesome conversations. And I've been enjoying the Uber driving. The money is sometimes definitely not worth it. The money on this thing isn't it. Um, it's not the money. But it's just the experience of meeting people and you know, going inside a lot of these gated communities and just getting a more in-depth understanding of the people that come to the city why they come here, what they like, what they don't like. It's just been mind-opening. And, you know, being in confined spaces with strangers has also expanded my understanding of human nature, human behavior. And it's just been an incredible learning experience where perhaps monetarily I'm not getting a lot from it, but I think the experience and knowledge that I'm gaining from being out there and dealing with real people has just been an eye-opening experience and a great experience at that. And I feel like a lot of the Uber drivers only look at the money, but I'm not really there for the money. I'm there just for the experience of what can I get out of this outside of the money. And after all, remember that the house that I live in, the car that I drive, and the lifestyle that I live could never, ever be accomplished by Uber driving alone. You would have to work 60 hours a day. It's just the math doesn't work out. So remember that this Uber thing isn't my main job. It's not even a fraction of what I make on YouTube. It's just something to do extra. And I think a lot of people don't understand. I used to work with this guy. Now, this guy owned properties. Now, I don't mean property. Properties, plural. This guy had paid off and owned several properties. But he had a normal job. Yes, a normal 9 to 5 job. Normal. It wasn't even a high-paying job. It was a stress-free, enjoyable job. He liked what he did. But the point is that not everything has to... Like, there are people who are net worth rich, and they have a normal job. And my last passenger was one of those people where I picked him up at a normal job, and I couldn't believe the house that I dropped him off at. So a lot of times people in the comments say, Oh, you're an Uber driver. You're like, you know, so what if I was an Uber driver? Even if, even if I was making a living off of Uber driving, does that make me less of a human now because this is what I do for a living? If I was working at a McDonald's drive through does that make me less of a human than somebody else? If you think it does, then you're clearly mistaken. I pick up people and drop them off in gated communities, and they're people that absolutely disgust me. They're rude, they're snobby, they're thankless. To me, they're worthless people. And then I pick up people at an office company at 12 o'clock at night and drop them off in the project so when they get out you're like wow that right there is an amazing person um a caring loving person instead of talking about themselves or what they want out of, out of life or other people they talk about you know how proud they are of their family or something so you know your value as a person isn't the house you live in isn't the car you drive your value as a person isn't even the job you have. Your value in society is what you can contribute to society. And some people, within their capacity, contribute a lot to society. And other people use all their resources to see what they can take from society for themselves. You know, life isn't about what you can take from society. It's about what you can give to society. And I think a lot of young people in particular today are very mistaken and being misled to think that your value is monetary, what you have or what you possess. I ended up here in Sarasota after Hurricane Ian destroyed Fort Myers, and I wasn't the only one. Probably hundreds, if not thousands, of people moved from Southwest Florida to Sarasota after Hurricane Ian. In fact, you can analytically track that through apps like Redfin, I think, to track how many people moved from one city to the next. Possibly thousands of people left Southwest Florida and moved to Sarasota after that hurricane, just like I did. And for those people, a lot of them, almost two years later, are still crying about the house they lost, the boat they lost, the golf cart they lost, the golf club collection. And, uh, you know, they're not even appreciating the life that's in front of them now because they're so consumed about the material things that at one point they had. Very sad. Don't be that person.